Good morning, everyone. I am Miss Melvore of Yoskoyama, and I will be your teacher for today. Today, I will be teaching you some of the most wonderful lessons in English and one of my personal favorites, the topic, figures of speech. Since I love poetry and literature, the figures of speech helps form wonderful stories and beautiful poems. So now, today, I will be teaching you a few of these figures of speech, and I hope you will have fun discussing this. So these are the figures of speech that we're going to learn today. The first one will be the similes, metaphors, personification, hyperbole, and litotes, and metonymy. So these are just a few of the figures of speech that we'll be focusing on. So, but first, let me ask you, what is the difference between literal and figurative language? What is literal? What is figurative? Okay. Any answers? Okay, so anyway, literal means actual. Okay. Literal means the exact meaning of something. The exact dictionary meaning of a word. A language that means what it appears to mean. So if you say big, then it's big. If you say small, then it's small. So that's the literal meaning. This is avoiding what exaggeration or any embellishment or adjective, you know, adding something to something. So it's literal. And you say it, the most obvious meaning of the word, the phrase, the sentence, or story. So there's something in it, not very artistic, it's just the literal meaning. So for example, oh, yes. The U.S. is a large country. Is it figurative? No, of course not. The U.S., the United States of America, is really a huge country. So, this statement, the U.S. is a large country, is literal. We're not using a figure of speech here, okay? Because you see, when you say literal, it means exactly what it says, word for word. So the U.S., what does it mean? It is exactly what it is. The U.S. is a large country. Another example number two, the weather is beautiful today. Yes, today, the weather is beautiful, but it's quite hot outside. And it's literal. It's literally hot and beautiful. So what does it mean? It is exactly what it is. The weather is beautiful today. So this is what literal means. And how about figurative? Figurative means the language that goes beyond the normal meaning of the word. Okay, there are words that we can use that may have a double meaning or can mean something different. Okay, so that is figurative. The language that goes beyond the normal. So this, this type of speech or sentence or statement use metaphorical figures or they are represented by symbols. So this is what figurative means. So in other words, you have to figure it out what it means. Usually poems and short stories or lines by famous actors and actresses on movies, they are figure. They are figurative. They have a deeper meaning that is hidden in the words. So for example, fragrance always stays in the hand that gives the rose. What does it mean? Do you really have to smell your hand to see? Do you have to really smell the hand of the person who gave you the rose to see if it smells? Of course not. It doesn't mean literally. Okay? It doesn't mean like that. So what does it mean? It's giving to others is gracious and the good feeling of giving space with you. So that is what this sentence means. It's completely different. Okay? Fragrance always stays in the hand that gives the rose. And the meaning, they're using fragrance, the word fragrance. But the literal meaning is when you give, you feel good about giving and it stays with you. So that is what it means. This is an example of a figurative speech. So when you see a figurative speech or a statement, 
You have to read between the lines because not everything is literal. Okay? So now I will present to you the figures of speech. So the first figure of speech we're going to learn is simile. A simile is a comparison made between two objects or an object and a person which uses the words like and as. Okay, so I will give you an example later. Again, the figure of speech simile is a comparison between two things or a person and an object using the words like or as. So for example, this is the example I'm going to show you. Friends are like parachutes. If they aren't there the first time you need them, chances are you won't be needing them again. Okay, so as you can see, life is highlighted there. Simile is very easy to remember, you know? Because simile will always use the words like, as. So when you see a sentence like this, friends are like parachutes, that means friends are being compared to the parachute using the word like. So what does it mean? Hmm, what does it mean? Does this mean that I should jump out of an airplane with my friends trapped to my back? Because you compare your friends with parachutes, you might be thinking that, oh, I need my friend if I go skydiving. Now, it's not the literal thing, but it means, what does a parachute mean, actually? Why do we have to compare a friend to a parachute? Because they might have a similar characteristic. Parachutes say what? Right? When you jump from an airplane and then you have a parachute on, you won't die. So some friends are like that. They are your lifesavers. So if they aren't there the first time you need them, when you need them and they're not around, then that means they're not good friends. Okay, so we don't say that we jump out of the airplane with our friends trapped in our bags because that's what this sentence is saying. It's not like that. So friends are parachutes. They may be similar or they may not be alike, but we are comparing a parachute to a friend because of the characteristics. The parachute save lives. Friends also save lives as well. So we're going to see the figure of speech similar. So, yes. So this is what it really means. Parachutes must be there for you the first time you need them or you will fall to your death, right? That's what I've said a while ago. Parachutes save lives. If they are not there for, the, for you the first time you need them, you will not need them again because you are dead. Exactly. So if your friends are there for the first time when you need them, that means they are your lifesavers. But if not, then you're already dead. They can help. You. So this is why we use the figure of speech simile, and we're using like. So another example of that is we can also say you are as fragrant as a rose. When you say you are as fragrant as a rose, and you see simile x, that means you smell so nice. That means you look nice, you're pretty, you smell nice then that's a simile. I'm comparing you to a rose. Okay? Or you can say, she is as beautiful as the sunset. It really sounds so good, right? That means that woman is breathtaking. Okay? Because where you see, simile. Let's move on to the second figure of speech I'll be teaching you today. It's called the metaphor. What is a metaphor? This is a figure of speech in which comparison is drawn between two dissimilar or unlike things without the use of like or as. Now you are comparing a thing with another thing or a human being, so an object which doesn't have a similarity, but you are not using the words like or as. So we might be confused now. How do you use this? We'll show you a few examples. Okay, the first example here is a good laugh is sunshine in the house. How do you understand that? A good laugh is sunshine in a house. 
Is a laugh a sunshine? Does it shine so bright? Do you bring the sunlight or the sun to your house? Of course not. It's not literal. You can't get the sun. Okay? But this is an example of a metaphor. What does it mean? Okay? This means, okay, you can see here that a good laugh is being compared to the sunshine. What does the sunshine bring into a people, into a person's life? What does sunshine bring into a person's life? Of course, laughter is different, totally different from sun. But what does it mean? Exactly. You might be thinking, okay, a good laugh is sunshine in the house. Now you must think all the characteristics of the sunshine. Happiness is always compared to the sun. The sunshine, the sun flowers, all the yellow things are connected to being happy. So this means that a good laugh is sunshine in a house. It means that you are bringing happiness into the house. This is using a metaphor. Okay. That's what I've said a while ago. Sunshine brings joy and happiness to people. It brightens up a room, a house, or wherever it is raised tribe. So a good laugh is sunshine in a house. Wherever you are, whatever, whichever corner you are staying in, if you are still laughing with a good laugh, then you are bringing happiness and joy into the house. So this is what the sentence really means. So this is an example of a metaphor. Okay? So you're comparing two things, sunshine and laughter, which are both totally different. The sunshine is where you get sunlight, of course. A laughter is a verb where you laugh. Okay, so these are two different things that you compare using metaphor. Actually, you can also trans transform this sentence into a simile. You can say, a good laugh is like a sunshine in a house. So that makes it a simile, but we are focusing on metaphor. A good laugh is sunshine in a house. Okay, so there are a lot of things that you can do to compare objects using metaphor or simile. So a metaphor is a direct comparison of two things. Direct. Unlike simile, it's sort of indirect because you're using like or as to compare these things. Now let's move on to the third figure of speech. We call this personification. This is a figure of speech in which animals, ideas, or objects are given human characteristics or form. Okay. In this figure of speech, I'm sorry, in this figure of speech, we are giving animals um, the power to interact. We're giving ideas, the verbs that only humans can do, or we can give objects, inanimate objects, characteristics of a human being. So anyway, I will give you an example here. The tree bowed and waved to me in the wind. Okay, let's dissect the sentence. Does a tree bow? Of course not. Does a tree wave? These actions are actions of human beings. This is what we call personification. The tree doesn't bow, the tree doesn't wave at you, but you're giving it life, personification. So, the tree bowed and waved to me in the wind. So it's like you're giving a fantastic, no, um, not fantastic, a uh, fantasy, okay? You're giving life to a fantasy, something like that. Because a tree doesn't wave, and it doesn't bow, literally. Okay? Let's move on. Okay, so you are giving what? Human characteristics and actions to the tree. The tree is being what? Personified. Meaning, you are giving life to a tree that is supposed to be your action to the tree that is supposed to be done only by humans. So you are comparing to unlike or dissimilar objects. The tree is like a person. Is it? Of course they're not. Okay. So 
So what does this mean? You can only imagine, right? When you see the tree bowed and wave to be in the wind. Close your eyes and imagine it. On the tree bowed and waved in the wind. So you are looking at the action of the tree. And it feels nice. So you can imagine how strong the wind was or how gentle the breeze was. So you can imagine the tree moving because you're giving it the action of a human being or a human character. So it's being personified as a character. Okay? So we'll not dwell on this more. Let's go to the fourth figure of speech. The fourth figure of speech is called hyperbole. This is exaggeration, okay? This is one of my favorite figures of speech. Hyperbole is extreme exaggeration. When you say huge, you can say gigantic, huge, enormous. That's exaggerated. So this is overstatement or exaggeration. So for example, you can say, I am so hungry I could eat a horse. That is exaggeration. You cannot eat a horse, can you? Of course not. That's exaggeration. Another 10,000 suns light up this room. Are there 10,000 suns? You only have one sun. That means you're trying to say that it's so bright, it's so wonderful. It's the light filled the room. There's no shadow in the room. You're trying to say that. But you're using the hyperbole figure of speech to express how you feel about the situation. So I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, or I'm hungry as a bear, or I'm so hungry I could eat a whole table of junk foods. Okay? So that is hyperbole. It's not actual, you cannot eat a horse, and you cannot have the 10,000 spots inside the room. It's just being be exaggerated, okay? Ridiculous image is being painted in our minds to get the significance and importance of the point across. So you are saying 10,000 suns light up the room. It is awesome. You imagine that. She's so beautiful. You can say she's blindingly beautiful. That's exaggerated. She can't blind you with her beauty, but you're just trying to say that she's so beautiful. Or you can say, I'm so sad that I can cry a river. That's exaggerated. You can't cry a river. But that's hyperbole. So I don't have to, I, I don't think, I need to explain the meaning of this because when you say I'm so hungry I can get horse, that means I'm really, really hungry right now. When you say 10,000 suns light up this room, that means this room is really, really bright. Okay? So these are both, what, exaggerations to illustrate a point. I want you to get my point, that's why I am exaggerating. Okay, so here are a few of the hyperboles that are humorous. Okay. According to John, Johnny, my sister uses so much makeup, she broke a chisel trying to get it off last night. That's a hyperbole. My teacher is so old, they've already nailed the coffin shot. That's exaggerated. And another, my dog is so ugly, you can't tell if he's coming or going. <laughs> so these are examples of hyperbole. I get, I, I wish, I hope you got it. She broke a chisel, that means that's so much makeup on her face. My teacher is so old, she's about to die. And my dog is so ugly, you can't tell if he's coming or going. Another is, your sister is so skinny, she has to run around in the shower to get wet. That means that's how thin she was, okay? Of course she gets wet in the shower, but to exaggerate the point, because I want you to understand that the sister is so thin, this is how I compare her to a shower. That's really, you know, the shower, the shower of water is so... They're evenly spaced, but what do you mean she can't get wet? That means that's how small she is. Okay? So this is hyperbole. Now let's move on to the next figure of speech. We call this litotis. Okay. 
This is a deliberate understatement, especially when expressing a thought by denying or negating its opposite. So you are going to express a thought by denying something, making something huge smaller, or making sm something small into huge, right, to a bigger thing. Okay, so we will see examples of that. You don't understand, right? What does it mean? What the? You're confusing me, teacher. But here's an example. It is a very serious. I have this tiny little tumor on the brain. And another, this is no small problem. Do you understand what I told you this now? It isn't very serious. I have this tiny little tumor on the brain. So when somebody tells you you have a tumor on the brain, how does it feel? It's a huge problem. It's on the brain. Well, I told this made it a little bit smaller. It's not a problem. I have this tiny little tumor. Exaggerate. Tiny little tumor on the brain. So, oh, you have nothing to worry about. It's just a tiny little thing on my, on my brain. But come on, having a tumor on the brain is a huge problem. Okay? This is no small problem. That means the problem is big. So does the first mean a brain tumor isn't very serious? No, of course it is very serious. So the seriousness of the situation is, is lessened or understated for an effect. It's just, you know, you're trying to deny that I have a brain tumor. It's a denial thing. You're trying to scale it down so you won't scare people. Another, in a second example, small is the opposite of big, of course. And then small is negated, making it seem less important. So there is, this is no small problem. That means the problem is big. So here's how you do it. This is no small problem really means this is a big problem. Okay, number one, the opposite of big is small. Number two, negate small by adding not or no. So you even it out, like you cancel out small. See, look at the sentence. This is no small problem. So if there's no here, you can say this is a small problem, right? But if you're using like totus, you want to emphasize that the problem is huge. You can negate the small, or you can make it negative or cancel it out by putting no. That means this is no small problem, that means the problem is really huge. You negate it. Okay? And if you restructure your sentence, it might look like this. This is a big problem, becomes this is no small problem. So this one is the normal, literal meaning. This one is like totis. Meaning you're trying to scale it down, not make a huge issue about it, but anyway, Problems really big. So I hope you get it. That is like Totus scaling down. Okay. Okay, another more on like Totus because I think this is one of the hardest figure of speech. Like Totus is used to express modesty or downplay one's accomplishments in order to gain favor or respect. You know, when you, you, you receive an award or something, a gold medal for something. You just want to downplay it because you don't want to be to come off conceited or you don't want to people to say like oh she is so proud of receiving the award you can negate it or you can downplay it into something smaller so for example if one just bought a bentley you know what a bentley is a bentley is one of the luxury cars in the world it's quite expensive a person may say it wasn't cheap Wow, your car is a Bentley. Yeah, I know. It wasn't cheap. That means you're not saying it's very expensive. Directly like, oh yeah, it's so expensive, I can afford it. Instead of saying that, you can just say it wasn't cheap. Because you want to be humble about it. You want to downscale it. You want to downplay it. Okay, another. If one is healthy, he might say, I'm not unwell, thank you. You can say, I'm very much healthy, 
But if you want to be humble about it, and just say, I'm not unwell, okay? That means you are happy. Another, if one played basketball outstandingly, he might say, I didn't play. Or as a great example, how did the basketball game go? And you were doing very well. And then you don't want to say, I did so well, I, I shot a lot of baskets and got a lot of baskets. But then you don't want to be proud or conceited about your accomplishment. You just you can only say, I did play it poorly. So basically, like Tontes is a very good figure of speech to express humbleness and to express yourself and downplay the achievements that you get. You know, you don't want to make other people jealous of you, you don't want other people to what to say, um, you don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable about their own selves or their accomplishment, you can use my tokens as the figure of speech. Now finally, we're on the sixth or the last figure of speech for today. We call this metonymy. A figure of speech in which a part represents a whole or a whole represents a part. Okay, what is this? Figure of speech which a part represents a whole or a whole represents a part. So for example, my hand represents my whole body. Okay, this is part of my body, so I can say my hand is part of my body. For example, I can say the dagger of the United States likes Saddam Hussein's army to pieces. And I pledge my service to the crown. Now, when you say dagger, this means the whole United States Army went to Iraq to get rid of Saddam Hussein's army. Now, the dagger represents the United States of America. Okay, so that's a part of the whole. That's the time. Another, I pledge my service to the crown. What is the service to the crown? Do I pledge my service to just the crown that sits atop King's head? No, you are pledging your services to the whole country. So when you say crown, the crown is just part of the whole country. That means you're being loyal to your country. You just, you can, I mean, you can say, I pledge my services to the whole country. But it sounds more alluring when you say, I pledge my services to the crown. That means you're going to be loyal to the country, the people, and the king. This is similar. This is a metonymy. So, the, the knife here, the same, it represents the whole U.S. Army. The crown represents the king and the kingdom. Okay, so that is a metonymy. We'll show you more examples. <coughs> Another example here. She was a girl 20 summers. 20 summers means 20 years. It sounds nice, doesn't it? Another a fleet of 30 sails docked at the harbor. The sail is a part of the whole ship, right? So you can say that a fleet of 30 sails, that means there are 30 ships. Okay, because the ship is part of the, the sail is part of the ship. This one. France has just beaten Ireland in the World Cup. Okay. France represents the soccer team. That played in the World Cup, Ireland represents the soccer team from Ireland as well. So in this case, the whole of France and Ireland it used to be uh, it used to represent a part of France, and Ireland their soccer team. So you can say France is just beaten Ireland in the World Cup. You don't have to say the France soccer team defeated the Ireland soccer team in the World Cup. It sounds more interesting. And then another one. Keep your eye on the ball. I have complete undivided attention. Okay? You can say your eye. Do you only use one eye? Looking at a ball? No. You use both eyes. You use your brain. Because you want to focus. Okay? The eye represents the whole of your brain and the whole of your focusing thing. He's always chasing skirts. Hmm. What, is the, what does the skirt mean here? Huh? The skirts mean... Women. Not only one, but most of the women. It's always chasing skirts. It's always chasing women. Another John Reed's Poe. Who's Poe? Of course, we have Edgar Allan Poe, the poet. He, read, he writes, he wrote poems. And if you say John Reed's Poe, that means, is he reading Poe? No. He's reading the 
works of Poe. All the works written by Poe. Okay, that's in tonic. Another, fragrance always stays in the hand that gives the drug. So actually, the first example that I gave you, the figure of speech is called the metonymy. Okay? Fragrance always stays in the hand that gives the drugs. Now, the hand represents the whole person who gives. Okay? And so the hand represents a whole person. Okay? And so now we have learned the figures of speech. Just a short, short review. We have similes, the metaphors, personification, hyperbole, mitosis, and metonymy. Okay. So this is it. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something.